Welcome to Books and Brew. I'm your host, Andrew Huff. I'm a novelist, screenwriter, director, all around media producer. And uh, this show is all about sitting down with fellow authors and getting to know about their writing process so I can steal their secrets for my own success. Uh, now, here's the thing I know about writers is often when we write, we have something to drink with us. Sometimes that's coffee or tea, uh, and sometimes it's other things. Uh, now, what I thought would be fun is as we get to know these authors, get to know uh, their books and what it takes to be a writer, I would get to try their favorite writing brew right along with them. So let's meet today's guest and find out what I am going to be drinking. Chris Theron is the writer and director of the films Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls. His novel Cradle Robber is now available in ebook. He is currently the writer and producer and host of the Truce podcast, which uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. When he's not busy flexing his creative media muscles, he teaches Sunday school and performs in a local uh, improv comedy troupe. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me, Andy. Dude, I'm so excited about our uh, conversation this morning, as I've kind of been already telling you like multiple times, because you have written so many things. And, I have. Uh, and it is so exciting. Um, I We are going to dive into this, but I will say out of the three of them, which this is currently what you're working on. So maybe that's why I'm like wanting to push it so hard. But Truce uh, is so great. Uh, oh, thank it's you, buddy. such a great podcast and yeah. your films were great and your novel is great, but your podcast, like, man, uh, I, if people aren't aware of truth, they need to go, they need to pause this video and they can go look it up right now. <laughs> wow. Wow. Cause it's a podcast they need. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I really love it. And it's, it's a huge passion of mine. And every time I think I'm going to run out of episodes, it's like, oh, here's a whole nother year's worth of ideas. So I just keep <laughs> coming up with more and more. I, just, I love doing it. Yeah. Well, we're going to find out. Uh, I have questions about just writing. Um, obviously, on this show, we've talked to a lot of fiction authors, which you have been uh, mm -hmm. and you are. Uh, and we uh, but what's going to be fun about this conversation is the how we get to kind of dive into writing in different media formats, because I do some of that, but you've done a lot of that. And so that's going to be really fun. However, the gimmick of the show is I get to drink what you drink while you're writing. And so Chris, yeah. what do you drink while you're writing? Well, because it's so highbrow, I drink the uh, off-brand Kroger Fizz & Co <laughs> root beer flavored root, uh, root beer flavored seltzer water. Uh, that sounds disgusting, but it is delightful. Have you tried it yet? <laughs> uh, I no, I can't, well, oh, I can't I wait have, to hear what you think about it. Uh, that, that is the whole concept of the show is I try it with you nice. and then I tell you what is going to happen what I think of it uh at but I tell you at the end okay, okay. Chris so gotcha. sure I'll, I'll be drinking it throughout it. but I, I don't review the drinks until I'm gonna the be end, on pins so. and needles the whole time I'm excited about this now you and I talked and you do drink some brews you drink some teas and everything but so yeah. much of this show is about me experiencing new things uh because uh I drink a lot of coffee and so I've tried a lot of different coffees uh what's kind of been fun is so far I haven't between coffee and tea, I really haven't uh, tried anything other than maybe a random Starbucks uh, flavor that I haven't, uh, you know, I get to try stuff that I haven't tried before, which has been really fun. And I can guarantee you, <laughs> this You've is a never new experience had that. for me. Oh, it, we, I had experience. this first on, an, so. on a trip I took to Moab, Utah, and then I couldn't find it again. So I bought one case and I had to like, just savor it. <laughs> <laughs> and then my brother and I drew, were driving all around the West, going on vacation and stuff. And we stopped at every grocery store we could to try to find it until finally my local grocery store started carrying it. And it has been That's a delight awesome. ever since. Yeah. Yes. Well, also on the show, when I'm brewing uh, the drinks, uh, that's when the author gets to pitch their work. So Chris, yep, I'm going to pop this open. I'm actually going to pour it over ice. I like seltzer water over ice. Nice. So I'm going to do that. And while I do it, that's, that's your time to pitch your projects. And when Sounds I'm good. done pouring, you stop. So you, that's how much time you have. You ready? Are you ready to yep. go? I'm ready. This Let's is the do timer. It. Here we go. And go. Okay. So Truce is a podcast that looks inside the Christian church. We try to figure out how we got here and how we can do better. And that means things like how do pyramid schemes target religious people and how do political campaigns get involved and why are we so angry as Christians? I also wrote uh, Bringing Up Bobby, which is a comedy film, a Christian and comedy. Stop. Oh boy, that was fast. <laughs> but I got, the, I got the most recent one out. That's the most important one. I'm kidding, Chris. Obviously you get to pitch your books. Oh my goodness. I hadn't even hey, read the book. I know. Hey, I cut you off 
that's a joke. Tell us about yeah. bringing up Bobby and uh, Between yeah. the Walls. You wrote two films. I did. Yeah. So there are two independent Christian films. My brother and I, I'm a twin. Uh, we worked on together. Bringing up Bobby is this film about a young man who's a goth kid who is challenged to figure out who he is and what he believes about God and before life gets complicated. And of course, it's a comedy. So life gets really complicated. And you can see the film now on YouTube or on Amazon Prime. It used to be back in the day in Hollywood video and blockbuster on television. If you remember what television is, <laughs> all these old words. Uh, it, yeah. So it was on Netflix when you could get just a DVD of it. Oh, so, wow. and it yeah. streamed on Netflix for a while, but, um, and then uh, be between the walls is a drama about a young man who finds out that his father was audio recording everything that happened in the house. And so it's a sort of like stand in for God. His father was a really mean guy who knew everything about him. And we can try to contrast that with God, who is a loving creator who knows everything about us, but is also very forgiving. And then uh, Cradle Robber is this really dark book that is about uh, a man who is who really wants to make the world into his image. And so he invents a time machine and goes back in time and aborts people. Uh, he doesn't like so people like he abortion he convinces their parents to get an abortion to get rid of them uh, so it is a it is a book that is kind of about abortion but it's more about uh, the reality that we can't force the world to be like we want it to be without becoming what we hate mm, that's so, awesome yeah yeah i mean again uh you have done a lot of cool stuff i think uh yeah everybody should uh, check those out. And we're going to specifically uh, kind of talk about where people can find you, where they can find their stuff. We'll do a lot of that at the end because I wanted to, uh, two things, I'm going to try the drink and uh, we're going to talk writing uh, in a little bit. So here it is. First I'm sips, gonna... you ready? Yep. I'm going to try one too. Yeah. You're going to take it. Now, here's the thing. I am, I will confess, I'm not a big root beer guy, but- what? I am a seltzer water guy. So I think, I think we're, we're, we're on the fence with this. We're not, okay. it's not a, it's not going to be a straight up, like, I can't stand it. <laughs> they also have a Dr. Pepper version, by the way. Okay. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> Here we go. That's the stuff. All right. Mm -hmm. I am not going to reveal my thoughts yet, Chris. Yep. That's fine. <laughs> It's fine. When you, well, I'll watch uh, as you chug this throughout the interview. And I know, right? Know that I've That's usually the key. That's usually mm -hmm. the key. If I if I'm go to review it and it's still here, <laughs> right? That's that's not a good you're sign. Like, you're like, oh, the right. kids are going to be drinking the rest of that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Hey, so we have our we have our uh, root beer seltzer water. Right. So we're going to sit down to write. Uh, Chris Darren's going to sit down to write, and. Uh, I am really uh, interested in us talking about kind of the leaps that you have made um, between media formats um, because I've written screenplays and I've written um, uh, novels. Now I will say the, the scripts that I've written have tended to be shorter, much shorter form. So you've written feature length, which are, you know, like 90 to hundred pages usually. And then, uh, and then novels as well. But then you're also writing a podcast. And so let's start with screenplays. And right. I kind of want to go through the challenges that you faced and maybe the pros and cons of each media format coming at it from the view of a writer. Like, oh, yeah, here's what was really cool about writing. Here's what's really challenging about writing in this particular media format. So let's start with screenplays. Yeah. Well, I think what the beauty of screenplays is that you don't have to write a lot of descriptions. So it's like, you know, Andy's heart was beating in his chest, you know, and some people like writing those things. To me, that's always a challenge. So I think the, the, the best part about a screenplay is not having to write a ton of description. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can leave a lot of the inner, imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The inner dialogue, which you're good at. I mean, your, your books are oh, really good you. at that kind of thing. And I, I can't do it. And I, I really struggle. So I, I think that was the biggest challenge for me uh, going into books. But as a screenwriter, I, you didn't have to do it. And I really found the joy of telling multiple stories at the same time, which is really easy to do in a screenplay. We're mm. kind of used to following multiple characters. Where in books, more and more publishers and agents are looking for you to give one person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And that can be really kind of constraining. It can kind of throttle you. Uh, where in like a film, the audience, it's very easy for the audience to know something a character doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And in a book, agents really want you to make sure that if something 
is known to the reader. It's something that is known to the character. Yeah. And that's, I struggled with that big time because I, I think one of the great joys of building tension is being able to hold things back from your character that the audience knows. Like they know the mm-hmm. bad guys coming around the corner or something like that. And uh, depending on, I mean, that'll, that'll change on you know, which genre you write for, for novels. Cause Christian novels are much tighter. They have all mm-hmm. these really strict sort of nonsense rules. I think they're nonsense, but uh, <laughs> you, you seem to work within them, but I couldn't. <laughs> I rewrote Cradle yeah. Robber like three times, like from beginning to end, just rewrote it, trying to fit into their mold. And I could not do it because I mm. needed to be able to switch perspectives. Yeah. And and they just hated that. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's a great, it's a great point to bring up because you're right. Um, uh, it's often referred to as deep POV uh, when you're writing in a novel um, that you, when you're in the point of view of that character of that, cha- that particular chapter, if, let's say you have multiple point of views, which is fine. You have to establish the point of view. And then you have to really consider, would this person know what's happening? And so often what ends up happening is there's another character that they're interacting with, but that you, in your mind, you're going, okay, this is how that character feels, but you can't, you have to try to, uh, bring it out in the way that they act or what's on their face or something that would clue the character that you're that you're in the point of view in to like I'm cluing you into the fact that they're upset with you but you have to describe that in such a way that your character would come to that knowledge instead of just saying oh they got really upset about that and so it's tough it's very hard uh right in that style (laughs) But with a with a film, with a screenplay, it's obviously going to film. And you're right. You're watching. You're the audience. You're kind of an outside observer. And so the one character may be totally oblivious to how the other character feels, but you're catching on, you know, be, as the as the person that's watching, because you're seeing, of course, obviously, if the filmmaker is doing uh, or is doing their job and cluing you into those things, um, it can be it can it can do a lot go a lot further for creating that tension from um setting up things later because then you're able to visually show like or or jump over to this story and be like here's what the villain is doing and you know that's going to come impact that those people later and all that kind of stuff so um you're right it is a lot harder it's easier to do it in writing a screenplay uh than it is uh in a in a novel because you have to take those things into consideration right yeah and I, I write, I tend to think in multiple stories at the same time. Mm. And uh, I, I think it's much more engaging for me as an audience. The books I tend to read have multiple stories going at the same time. And the movies I like have that as well. I don't generally like a, a movie that just follows one person around. And, and so it's hard for me to write that, but that's what the market wants. And I think that's one of the hardest <laughs> things as a writer is to give the market what it wants. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why I've been an independent this whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because... I, I'm, I'm not giving the, the market what they want. I'm trying to tease them into being like thinking deeper and wanting something better. Yeah, for sure. Well, and honestly, there are waves of that, uh, that I have certainly felt, um, it being kind of involved in the industry. Um, and we can talk a little bit Christian fiction, but also Christian film as well of kind of there had been some ground rules set. There had been some gatekeeper set uh, over the course of several years. And people are starting to find ways to kind of work around that and reach audiences because this is what's kind of funny about um, where I started versus where I'm going now, which is, you know, I'm probably much more uh, of a screenplay writer anyway, rather than a novel writer, because I'm a very visual person. I, I see it happening in front of me. And so, um, you know, it's, it's so much easier to kind of communicate that when you're doing it in film, but I went to the novel writing route because it's so hard to make a film. It's expensive to make a film. Yeah. Uh, and yet nowadays, so this was back in when I started writing novels, like, uh, you know, a very long time ago, (laughs) 15, 16 years ago, uh, when, uh, but nowadays, there are advances in technology have made it to where I have a camera in my pocket that yes, I could go make a film with really. I mean, can you imagine when you were making your films, (laughs) 
if you had access to some of the tools that that are available today. Yeah. Uh, the, and, the difference is the distribution has changed a lot, so it's actually much yeah. harder to make money now than it was when I made my movies 15 years ago, uh, because we were selling. You know, if somebody walked into a Hollywood video rented your DVD, which they could, oh, he's drinking more of it. That means he likes it. The, you <laughs> rented a DVD from Hollywood video. We would get about a dollar from Hollywood video every mm. time, whether they watched it or not. Mm, now on right. Amazon, we get paid six cents per hour watched. Wow. So if they watch our whole hour and a half film, we're getting nine cents, Yeah. Right? which is, is terrible. You can't yeah, do anything oh, with awful. that. If you yeah. do the math about how, how much you have to make in order just to pay one person for one day of work, from nine cents, it's terrible. And mm. so the, the distribution world has gotten much harder. And Amazon also favors large producers over small producers. So if you're mm. like Disney, you get more money than an independent oh, yeah. does. So it's yeah. also not fair as far as that goes. So a lot of people are turning to things like crowdfunding and all that. Mm -hmm. But crowdfunding is dependent on you having an audience already. Mm -hmm. And that that is uh, a, another trick. And so you have to get into doing things like being popular online already so that you can then raise money. So yeah. you're adding all these extra steps in where you have to like already have a platform and, all, and, and be good at doing what you're doing and, uh, or what I'm doing with the, uh, the podcast mm -hmm. and just to get to the point where you can even begin making your film. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much harder because the independent filmmakers, especially in the Christian world, because there's no money, you have to be good at not just making the movie, which is already like miraculous when it comes out good. Like it's miraculous, <laughs> but you also have to be very good at screenwriting and location finding. And yeah. you have to be good at raising money on the internet. And you have to come up with a plan and a good contract that makes sense where you either, if you're going to pay your, your audience who crowdfunds you back, like the chosen does, or if you're just going to keep all the money, you have to come, you have to be really good at all that stuff. And then you have to be really good at post-production and advertising for the film on your own because nobody's going to advertise for it for you yeah. um so that that was the problem we ran into is that my brother and i were were good at making the movies but we were terrible at marketing we, <laughs> we don't like it and yeah. uh, we had no money for it and it does require a lot of money yeah. and uh, and we were bad at raising money at the beginning because we don't know any rich people and uh, and or we didn't at the time and still don't know any that would want to finance my work. But, uh, <laughs> the difference between knowing did, rich people. Didn't at the time, I was like, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> what about I, now, live in, Chris? I live in the wealthiest town in the United States. So it's, uh, you know, you're going to know wealthy people. It's just that uh, the difference between knowing them and wanting get, right. having them want to finance <laughs> you is a whole yeah. other thing. So it, the independent then has to do, it, it sounds sexy, you know, like, oh, you know, you got a camera in your pocket. You can go make a movie with your iPhone and you yeah. can, but the, sometimes actually, I think generally making the movies, the easiest part, uh, I think the pre-production, mm. the post-production are much harder. Yeah. Just oh yeah. No, that's great. Well, so let's shift then. Uh, yeah. So now let's, we've been talking about screenwriting and we talked about that process, which by the way, just side note, because I think you're right. Uh, in the sense, especially when you were talking about the, you know, having to build a platform and all that kind of thing, that, that is absolutely becoming true of even books as well. Yeah. Um, because of the, uh, you know, take whatever you kind of, if you want to blame Amazon's, uh, you know, how cheaply they've made everything, uh, or whatever, it, it is a lot harder to make money on a book because people aren't going and buying books and bookstores. And so the price of books and what an author gets off that book is, is, has fallen. But uh, yeah, so like all of these things are true, I think across those formats, it's not just true about Christian film. It's also true about, uh, about writing books in it. And I think there's probably some instance where there's some of that, that's also true about podcasting, but let's, oh, true, uh, yeah. yeah, let's shift to now the novel and we've kind of already dabbled in that a little bit of the difference between screenwriting and writing a novel <laughs> and the challenges. Right. Yeah. But it, was there anything uh, that you found easier to do with the novel? Or was there anything that you got more excited about maybe in writing a novel than, than maybe the screenwriting? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, it was the, the Cradle Robber is a bit of a dark book as we discussed it involves abortion. <laughs> and um, uh it was something that I, I really did want to make it into a movie, but I couldn't understand. I couldn't figure out how we would get an audience for this movie because it's also a bit of a bait and switch where people think it's about abortion, but it ends up being about anger and hatred. Mm. 
um, and, and the, the destructive nature of those things. And um, so it was not going to be really hard to pitch as a, as a movie, but it was, you know, for the book, it was just basically my time to write it. And it was one of those deals. It was like a story that I had I sat on for a long time. I wrote as a short, short story and I sat on it for a long time. And then it was like, I have to make this into something. Otherwise, this idea is never going to leave me. And I think that you know, a lot of authors probably have that idea that like, there's going to be this idea that's going to haunt you until you write it <laughs> and really stink. Um, yeah. So, and I've had that even as a podcaster where I've had ideas that come up and it takes me a year to make that into a project. And then finally I can rest. But uh, so that, that it was really good for me to be able to write something that was much darker and not have to make a ton of money on the on uh, on it back. I still haven't paid off that book, by the way. But um, mm. <laughs> just the the formatting and the proofreading and stuff, still yeah. haven't paid it off. But I was at least able to get it out. Uh, so that's that's like a big relief. Mm -hmm. And it was a story that I still really believe in and would like to come back to. And if I ever, God willing, get to make another movie again, I still want to make that movie. Um, but yes, it's, 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 you get to live in, and build out a fantasy world where there's, you know, in, in the, in the book, there are trains involved. There's a time machine there in a, in a film, it would be like period costumes, uh, a different technology. And I don't have to worry about that stuff because I'm not mm -hmm. filming it. So that's a, that's a real relief. <laughs> a real yeah. relief. I mean, that was, uh, again, we've kind of talked about my books and, you know, my desires to yeah. essentially turn them into films at some point. And I've always been kind of like, uh, I don't know if that would ever happen just because they're I go books. into their action books and yeah. I don't, I have no limitations, you know? Right. Um, I, now I seek to write uh, uh, realistically um, with heightened uh, tension um, because it is it for entertainment purposes and it's fiction. Very, very, uh, very, uh, I liken it to a Mission Impossible film. If you were going to go to watch a Mission Impossible film, you never feel like uh, often with those, it sometimes, I should probably say sometimes it go, it stretches the <laughs> bounds of believability, but for the most part, you, you, you're there, you're in it. You're like, sure. Um, and so that's kind of how my books are. And uh, gosh, that would just be so expensive to make. And that's mm -hmm. the fun part about writing books. Uh, but also a little bit of the, you know, I, I, for me, let's say my books were, became so popular that people did offer me the chance to make a film based on it. Uh, I, I just have a certain threshold that I go, I'm probably going to say no and not, and not, uh, not sign a contract or whatever to release the rights because uh, threshold being budget, because I know until it reaches this, it's just never going to meet what I visualized when I was writing it. And, it, you know, and so of course, you know, you could make, you could make it, you could turn it into a book and just cut all the action and then, <laughs> yeah. you know, or make it into a film and cut all the action, but then it wouldn't be that. I don't feel like it, I would love it that much. Right. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, people want to see those explosions in the car. There's car chases in your books and stuff. And you, yeah. even a simple car chase is expensive to do. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So let's uh, move now down the timeline because you were, uh, you, you wrote screenplays, then you wrote the novel. Now you're, you're writing still, yeah. uh, but now new media format, which is a podcast, which mm -hmm. maybe what you can do is dive a little bit more into specifically an episode of truce and what you're dealing with and often kind of how you're approaching it. Um, and, and then how the writing, how you're writing, are you approaching that as a writer has yeah. probably necessarily changed, but also maybe given you some, uh, you've brought maybe some of those things that you've learned into it as well. Yeah, yeah, I have. So uh, some of my episodes, especially the ones that are uh, sort of the, the typical truce episode, I often start out in the middle, uh, which is something that they tell you to do in creative writing. It's like start in the middle of the story. And so it'll often be starting explaining something like how cool shipping containers are. And then I want the audience to be like, why on earth is he talking about <laughs> shipping containers? And, and then I go to the, and I sort of tease out, this is going to be really important later. And then I go into, you know, uh, Truce is the podcast that you know, looks and uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church, which is like this little slogan I have to let people know what the show is about, because we've just been talking about shipping containers for the last five minutes. <laughs> what, what is the show about? And then, then I get into, then I go back. And I, I end up working through uh, 
the topic of whatever it's going to be. And eventually we arrive back at shipping containers <laughs> <laughs> and, and be, then be like, Oh, I get why he started with that. And so it, like, usually I start in the middle and then jump backwards so I can kind of hook the audience in on something, you know, I've done things about like a attacks on submarines um, the teased out wars, that kind of stuff. And so uh, that sort of just structurally is what I'm always trying to do. And so that, like when I get to sort of halfway to three quarters through the episode, there's a moment where like, oh, I get what he's talking about. And, and that sort of builds tension with the audience and keeps them listening and a sense of mm -hmm. wonder. I think a sense of wonder is really important in storytelling. And then, uh, so what I do is I, I write out I, I, the script generally. And um, since I'm using often audio clips from experts or on location where I've gone, I, in my editing program, which is called Hindenburg, um, I will go and as I'm writing the episode, I'll write normally in like a word processing document. And then I'll just have in brackets, the clip, the audio clip that goes in there, the, mm. the next thing. And so I'm often going through my interviews and stuff as I'm writing it. And then I can like go back and insert things earlier or put them in later. Um, so that's generally my process. It's going to get a little more complicated in season five, which is I'm going to be tracking the rise of fundamentalism in the United States, mm. um, which is actually why I'm in my church basement right now, because I got to meet with some people uh, in a few, uh, well, half an hour or so to discuss the layout of season five. But um, in season five, I've got multiple authors that I interviewed, and I'm going to be spreading their interviews throughout the whole season. And so that's going to kind of complicate things a little bit more, but I'm always mm -hmm. for like mm -hmm. ratcheting up my game. I'm just going to have to ask <laughs> for more patience from my audience because there's going to be a few months maybe where I don't have an ep a new episode come out. I'll just release some mm. old ones. Uh, but in order to like step up the game, it takes extra time because I'm yeah. doing this part time. So um, yeah, so the, it involves a lot of planning. Like I've got a spreadsheet that I've got going that has every episode and, and a bunch of the sub stories within that episode. That's what I'm meeting with the guys about today is I'm going to present my story and be like, okay, what makes sense? What, what's makes sense? What needs to be cut? Cause right now season five looks like it's going to be 20 episodes and I really think it should be 15. So that we're going to kind of <laughs> figure out how to hone this thing down. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of the process. Um, and I, I, what I end up doing, and I think it's really good for, especially if you're a screenwriter um, is to, to be able to talk through your stories with people, with your friends, which means boring them sometimes. Um, like I'll get friends out on a hike and then I'll just like rattle off, tell them about the gold standard and how cool it is. And these are the main players in it and that kind of thing. And then I can kind of gauge from their reactions, what works, what doesn't work. And then maybe they ask me questions and mm. I can be like, oh, I've got to fill in that gap, don't I? Um, and so any, anytime you can uh, to talk to people about your project, mm. and to me, it helps. Um, at screenwriting, I used to, uh, my brother and I would read the lines out loud to, mm. to be like, does this make sense? Can we actually see somebody saying this line? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that helped us to try to find a natural way of speaking for our characters. Um, I guess you could probably do that for a novel as well. You could just read your dialogue out. Yeah, um, I've uh, actually had conversations and uh, done some workshops on dialogue where yeah. um, that can be a helpful way. I find myself doing that. Um, there, it's what's funny is it's not even you know with dialogue saying it out loud or having having someone else kind of hear it um, is really helpful. But then honestly, just sometimes physicalizing uh, you know a story just because I will I have to like sometimes get up if I have a character that needs to escape a you know escape from being held back by someone or whatever, and I have to like get up and maybe like get my wife involved in like. <laughs> trying to figure out the right way, you know, to, or just think through or watch a video of someone doing a tutorial on it or something like that. So there's so much, uh, I think that when you experience or when you, um, sort of recreate the experience or recreate the dialogue or recreate what you're trying to tell, it, it helps give you a, a better perspective on it. And one thing that you mentioned that I think is true across, um, or that I think is really, really helpful to point out and, and interesting to think about is uh, you even as doing a podcast that you could say is a nonfiction, right? And you're uh, almost a journalism podcast. Uh, story still very much plays a part of it, right? It um, yeah. The constructs of story, the uh, ways in which you engage people uh, in learning maybe about something 
is so story driven, even when maybe we don't realize it's story driven because yeah. we may, we may be going, Hey, you know, this podcast is on X topic or whatever. And Chris is talking about shipping containers. Like, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, while I'm in because I, well, how does this connect, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and yet that is such a, they're, they're engaged in the story. They're like, now there's a story you have to right. them into a story, not I'm going to teach you about multi-level marketing, you know, or <laughs> right. Which I do, but yeah, just yes. in different ways. Yeah. So like <laughs> even like teaching MLMs, multi-level marketing, I, I got a group of friends together here at church and I walked them through how you lose money in an MLM. And uh, actually like they were holding money and trying to like hold on to it, but I kept having to pass it to the next person. And uh, so I, if I can, I try to get out in the real world and, and get people involved in this, the subject, or I try to find um, a, a, an event that illustrates a particular point. So like for, I've got an episode coming up about the gold standard where I interviewed Jacob Goldstein from Planet Money. Mm. And uh, he helped explain the gold standard. And we did it through a whole bunch of examples uh, involving, you know, things like uh, the price of tacos. And so if like you can <laughs> bring it down to tacos, oh, I know what tacos are and I know what the price of a taco is. And then, and then we could use that. So the audience could then kind of figure out if the, the price of a taco goes down, you know, uh, if I owe Andy a hundred dollars, and I, that I sell tacos for a dollar a piece. Great. That means that I only have to sell a hundred tacos and Andy's paid back. If that's, if I make profit of a hundred dollars, a dollar on everyone, but if the value of all the goods goes down, you know, and, and now the taco, it, it, it sells for 80 cents or something like that. I have to sell much more taco, many more tacos. Mm in order to pay Andy back. So you kind of like use those kind of examples to draw people in. I know what a taco is. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that, that helps a lot rather than just sort of lecturing them about right. know, inf inflation versus deflation, which is yeah. fascinating stuff, but it's hard to picture um, yeah. for us normal folks. Yeah. Well, and that's why people should go check out Truce because it's not just hearing about these things. It's done in such a creative way and such engaging manner. Um, that it really is a, a great podcast to add Thanks, to man. your lexicon of podcasts. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> can you use lexicon in that term? That that's not there. I don't know. Way. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you started something new. Why not? Yeah. There we go. Hey. Okay. Review yeah. time. Oh wow. Uh, it's gone. So, uh, here's the thing. Am I gonna go run out and drink root beer? Probably not, uh -huh. but uh, Chris, I, I, you have you you have moved the needle for me. Nice on root beer. How okay, about we great. say that? <laughs> I love it. I, love it. I went back to it. I was drinking it, and it's uh, it's really good. And here's also what I would say as a as a I got I like seltzer water, um, and uh, and Fizz and Co. Pretty good. Like honestly, I'm sure they have other flavors. So they do recommended uh as a seltzer water you could get any flavor you want you could try the root beer one it's a kroger yeah. brand so and i'll link to it hopefully you uh i don't know if you can order it online or not but we'll see <laughs> if, it, if you can it's linked to in the show notes <laughs> nice yeah i'm not that fancy i don't order groceries i'm like yeah. <laughs> yeah all right hey um tell us uh we kind of hinted at uh where we could see bringing up bobby in between the walls um right. but how do we see that how do we get cradle robber uh how do we listen to truce uh, so you can find uh, all of those actually at trucepodcast.com. I've got links to all of it. So that's maybe just the easiest way. Perfect. How about um, that? <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. And so I encourage you guys to go listen to Truce, uh, pick up Cradle Robber uh, in ebook format and, uh, and uh, definitely uh, watch uh, the films. And you can find out about my stories at andrewhuffbooks.com. Uh, that's where you can go to also find me on social media. Uh, I know maybe you didn't mention this, but Truce is also on some social media platforms. Right, at, at Truce Podcast. That's um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yeah, so definitely go follow, give Chris a follow. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on Books and Brew. Um, thanks for your knowledge in all the writing and Hey, you know what? Maybe one day soon we can go crack open one of these together That'd be uh, great. when we're working on something, a new film, maybe together or something like that, I'd love that. <laughs> someday soon. I'd love it. It'd be great. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks, buddy.